Welcome to Married to Movies. Industry insiders John Russell and Tracy Kring live and work happily in cinema matrimony. They're sharing behind the scenes adventures of writing, producing, and appreciating films. Good morning, babe. Oh, wow. Did the podcast start? It did just now. <laughs> Did you not realize that th- this was going to be breakfast every morning of your life, a podcast? Um, I'm just saying that um, this is a larger commitment than I was um, prepared for. I was like, yeah, maybe, you know, we'll do it a, like a couple of times a week. This is now part of my life well, every morning. Anything worth doing is worth I, doing a lot. I have to be erudite. Ooh. Is that a gemstone? <laughs> or is no. that a Hitler thing? It's not a gemstone nor a Hitler thing. It means being um, wise and uh, well-spoken. Which apparently, you're not that erudite if you don't know what it means, babe. Take a taste of the coffee because there was a change today. Uh Uh-oh. Okay, let's see if you get any of the change. It was very cinnamony. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. I couldn't find the cinnamon. Use the cinnamon stick. No, I did not. What? I used the pumpkin spice. Oh. Oh, interesting. Okay, well, yeah. I'm, I'm cool with that. It's just more cinnamony. Okay, well, there you go. A friend of ours, one time we, we were at his apartment, and he was making coffee, and he put a cinnamon stick in his coffee maker in his grounds. And he's like, yeah, and the cinnamon stick lasts for, like, you know, a couple of a couple We of know the craziest people. No, and his, <laughs> his coffee was just cheapo coffee, but it tasted so good. And then another friend of ours was staying with us for a little while, And she put salt in her coffee, and she said that's something they used to do at the diner. Because everybody thinks diner coffee is so good, but they're just putting a little salt in there in the grounds. So we do both. I tell you. We put cinnamon and salt. And I'll say this, we always get compliments on our coffee. We do. And it's just cheapo Walmart coffee. We do. We do. That was like a scene in uh, Pulp Fiction. Where they're talking about the coffee. And I love that. I, lo- I love uh, Quentin Tarantino when he just kind of zeroes in on the kind of the simple things that everybody talks about. I, I read and I love to read as kind of a Bible the script for True Romance. It's such a beautiful piece of script writing. I highly recommend that. And if you don't know it, there's something called the Internet Movie Database. Mm-hmm. And you can actually look up scripts. And oftentimes it will be... Real scripts, Mm -hmm. full of scenes that were not shot. Right. So one of the most famous scripts uh, that everybody really uh, talks about as like uh, considered to be one of the greatest screenplays of all time, just the way that it is written. And it's probably about a third longer than uh, the movie actually is, is the script for Heathers. Oh, I have to, I haven't read that. Yes, yes. Uh, and there's a lot in the script that wasn't in the movie, but it's mm. just funny as hell. Mm. Plus, it has the uh, extra Heather's ending, which they got rid of, which is the prom in heaven. Oh, oh yeah. Okay, <coughs> I will definitely check that. Check that little thing out. Because remember, he has that line that heaven is the only place that uh, different social groups can uh, get along with each other, right? And then at the very end, they have a prom in heaven. Oh. Because because he blew up the school. He blew up the school, right. He actually blew up the school. They changed that and made it just that he blew up himself. I am totally down to read that. I enjoy reading other screenplays, especially like to movies that I've seen. As good as it gets, I love reading that. Mm -hmm. They're just, you know, little, little works of art. That actually leads us into one of the things that we said last night we wanted to talk about. Today. Okay, awesome. You randomly got an email. You 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 get a lot of random emails, in my opinion, because you have all these like different ecosystems in which you're moving. You got an email from someone, and uh, they basically kind of wanted you to take a look at the script, um, look at the pitch deck, mm-hmm. um, give some opinions. Yeah, they... They had put out that they were looking for um, an AD and a producer. So I had um, talked to the director and had a great conversation. And he had sent me uh, the script. It was for a, a horror movie. And uh, it was a really good... It was a really good... I, I read a lot of scripts that I'm just kind of like, why am I having to read this? And this one really kind of reminded me 
of just the great like late seventies haunted house, uh, you know, horror movies. Um, you know, as you were reading it, you were like, wow, this is really good. Yeah. This is, this is kind of giving me vibes. This is, you know, really fun. We won't get too specific about anything. He wanted to put me together with his producer and he wanted me to talk to her for a while. So you guys started talking about the script, your feedback. Right. And she had, as producers will have, because it's, you know, their money. Not really. Well, it's their money to take care of yeah what what a producer will do is they will kind of connect you there they'll be this like you know hub that other you know monies and things like that they may bring on money right and they also may put some money into it they sure. feel responsible they're responsible basically. for yes the money turning into a movie his his last movie uh which did pretty well um was made during covid and he made it for like fifty thousand dollars so this is a different animal. This is like this you, is like a real real budget. yeah. This is like you know somewhere in the neighborhood of a half a million to a million dollars is what they're talking about for this movie. When you're doing that, I mean, you better have all your ducks in a row with people. Sometimes in a script, uh, there are just things that I just call just like little like the little threads that hang off of a uh, carpet. Right. You know, they, they're just kind of like, why is that there? Where is that going? Where did that come from? We just need to sew these back up. We just need to, you know, or, or, or clip them off. Mm-hmm. You know, just clean the script up a little bit. Mm-hmm. Especially when you have a really, really good script, then uh, the things that are uh, a little bit more iffy, they stand out more. They do. Yeah. <laughs> it's a... It's a racer's edge there. So we were just talking about the things that we could do and that we would encourage uh, the director and the writer to do. And she was like sort of gathering uh, my ammunition. And she was taking it in a, a little bit of a uh, concerned direction. And I said, look, with a writer, you just need to be positive. He just needs to feel like this is an opportunity. This is a this is a new layer that we are adding on. We're not tearing down the house. We're adding a sunroom. Mm-hmm. Okay? This is something else that is going to improve, you know, the script. I told her exactly how I would put it with him, and then she said, "Could you repeat that because I didn't record it?" <laughs> That happens to you all the time. Yes. Just like... uh, yeah, and uh, I believe I believe I said we're trying to add a new layer of mythos where the uh, original story and the new story are interesting enough on their own that the audience is excited when they connect at the end. And she's like, I'm going to say that verbatim. Yeah, exactly. She said, <laughs> what was that word? I said, mythos. It was not erudite. That was not the word. She was saying that she was afraid some of the feedback she might get back would be, you know, resistant. And and basically that the director does want some of the threads loose. He Here, doesn't want it all shored up. You'll hear this a lot from uh, script writers. I don't want everything, you know, explained to the audience. They're assuming they're working with a sophisticated audience, which they are, about some things, about movie things. But some things they're not as sophisticated about. And also, loose threads, I mean, they're also, you could trip over them. Mm. <laughs> you know? That's right. <laughs> But it's kind of, in my mind, the rule of two plus two equals four. Oh, okay. okay. We're going scientific this morning. Well, (laughs) if four is, okay, they have enough information that whether they actually know all of the details about something, they get why it's there. I understand. That's just kind of a little... A little mystery. Maybe only I can figure it out. You know, everybody might get to have an idea about the the thing. And then that gives them something to talk about, you right. know, over pie later, right? Right. That's cool. That's cool. But they do need two plus two. Like, you can't just give them a two. Mm-hmm. Because a two is just like, well, I don't understand why that was included. Right. Like, it didn't go anywhere. Mm-hmm. You know, like, what was that doing? What was I supposed to get from that? Yeah, the ch- the classic thing of that is what's known as Chekhov's gun, where the principle is if you see a gun in Act 1 of a play, the gun has to go off in Act 3. There has to be a conclusion. There has to have this feeling of, okay, 
now I understood why this character was introduced, what they meant to the story. <clears throat> what, what they bring, what they brought out. Right. Kind of giving uh, everybody, you know, on the page and in the film, kind of their moment, you know, giving them something important to do, not making sandwiches, not, not, not as bad as that, but just balancing out, you know, your, uh, your worlds to where it doesn't feel like one character is sort of like the person that's holding like everything, the whole story on their back. And everybody else is kind of following them up, you know, Mount Everest. Sometimes the audience, you will have given them 2 plus 2 equals 4. Mm-hmm. And you'll sometimes give them the answer for. Yeah. Like, um, I remember one time we went to see, with some friends, the movie The Others. The Others with Nicole Kidman. Gothic horror movie. Nicole Kidman is living in this house with her children and instilling them with fear. And and the creepy caretakers. Right. The know. creepy caretakers. And they are absolutely terrified that this to house like leave is... To leave the house. To leave the house. But they are also <laughs> terrified to live in the house because the house is haunted. Are we actually going to give the... Spoiler uh, alert. Are we going to spoiler alert? It's old as hell. It's like 20 years old or something. It's old. Okay. Spoiler alert. Okay. Spoiler alert. Beater, beater, beater. That's my alert sound. Okay. Uh, it sounded like a... They were uh, ghosts. Yeah, they were ghosts. They were ghosts. Right. Nicole Kidman and her kids right. were ghosts. And, and this is kind of like... I, I feel like some other gothic haunted house movies have done that. Yeah, yeah. It's not... It wasn't even a new But thing. it was. it was wonderfully done because what happens in it is that... The, the mama does... Nicole Kidman doesn't know they're ghosts. Right, right. And... The ghosts that they were experiencing were actually psychics that were trying to contact them. Right, right. I remember that. Yeah, right. they were they were psychics trying to get them to cross over. Right. And the and Nicole Kidman just they saw them as ghosts. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so no, it was it was really cool. And you know, I kind of like to watch that movie again because it was it was a cool little spooky film. And the caretakers were also ghosts. Yes. Yes, but they knew they were ghosts. Right. 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 They they were aware, self aware. Right. So we're driving home after we watch this movie with our friends. With our friends, we find out through conversation. Well, yeah, you know, we're we're just talking about the movie, and we thought it was, oh my god, what a great twist! Oh man, that was fantastic. It was great. They, right. you know, they were ghosts. That right. was great. That right, was a right. great twist. Right, right. And our friends are like, no, 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 no. They we didn't say that first. Oh, sorry. Remember what we said first, and and they were like, ah, I didn't, I, I didn't really like it. I, yeah, I they didn't. didn't yeah, like I didn't it. get it. I was like, really? Why? What? It didn't. It didn't make any sense. I didn't understand. And we were like, what do you mean you didn't understand? And uh, it was just like, well, what was that at the end? I'm like, they were ghosts. And they went, what? They were ghosts? <laughs> they were ghosts I mean, in the end? they watched the whole goddamn movie. <laughs> if, if, how, how did they miss that? It was. It, it literally explained completely. Like, like completely like covered. Like laid out like a buffet in front of you. Yes. Okay. It's like they, they, they go step by step. I mean. We, every single thing in the movie. Yeah. They were ghosts. They were ghosts. <laughs> I'm like, no wonder you didn't like the movie. <laughs> I, I was just like thinking to myself, well, I, I really hope that they were like in the bathroom on that review. No, they were not. But they were not. No, they were not. No, no. <clears throat> they, <clears throat> they really didn't get it. Yeah. Now, that's a case where you did everything. Yes. To so those filmmakers, they did everything. Right. They, the, uh, you can't You help. spoon-fed them after they'd had a stroke, and they did not swallow. You cannot help if you... <laughs> How about eat, that analogy? Yeah. <laughs> you let them, you let them straight to the ending, they didn't see it, you know, okay, you tried, <laughs> you tried. But but that but you know you that's a spectrum. Your audience is a spectrum, right? And you have to remember, like there are some of them who don't watch a lot of horror movies, and right. that was our friends. They don't watch horror movies. No, no, no. They so, they do not enjoy horror movies. So yes. the the cues that we were being fed that we get, they're not getting. Right. You know. So I'm not saying right to the lowest common denominator. I'm just saying remember like every do- everybody doesn't have the same sophistication and experience. So make sure if you want these little elements of mystery that people can talk about later, make sure you give them enough to put together. And 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 very simply here, don't try to 
uh, have a mystery in your like lookbook either. Because that was one of the things. He's like, I don't want to give it away. And, and she's like, these are people who are giving you money, okay? They want you to give it away. If you're making a lookbook for The Sixth Sense, Bruce Willis is dead in it. OK, it's very important because that is important to sell this movie. That's what you're. In I'm the sorry. Act. That was a, that was a spoiler alert. Sorry. OK. Oh, you're God. Bruce Willis you, you is You told dead. him and then said it was a spoiler. But uh, if you have. I didn't go. <laughs> you. Well, the only people you screwed it up for is like millennials who haven't seen it. Haven't seen the sixth sense. Sorry, yeah. guys. I, I will Do you think say- they had a conversation about saying sixth sense? Sixth sense. The sixth sense. It's not an easy thing to say. Yeah, you, it, it is a little hard to get out. But, but, uh, dude, I totally agree with you on that. Uh, in your promotional materials and stuff, if, if you're afraid of giving it away, make people sign NDAs. That's what they're damn for. Right. Okay. Sign an NDA. I mean, you know, it puts your mind at ease a little bit more. But nobody wants a freaking mystery when they're going into. A project, okay? You know what wasn't a mystery yesterday? What? Uh, us watching this new series, Platonic. It was so good. Oh, I loved it. Was it? I mean, I'm not always absolutely sold on Seth Rogen. I, I am. I mean, you know, sometimes his shtick gets a little bit... Oh, I feel The like, same thing, you I know? I feel like this is like the Seth Rogen that makes, like, ashtrays. <laughs> the, the, you know, no, like that's that's one of his little sidelines. He makes ashtrays. Like oh yeah, 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 beautiful yeah. little pottery ashtrays. Right, right, are, right. Like for smoking weed. Yeah, for smoking weed. Um, yeah. I feel like it's ashtray Seth Rogen. It's probably more, like more, more relative to who he truly would be on a day to day basis. This uh-huh. character, right? You know, he's not like the young guy who's crazy. You know, over smoking weed. And and it's just really good. I think it's tailor made for people our age. You know who is really impressing me, and I'm I'm loving is just Rose Byrne. Physical is a series that we are also really really big fans of. Yes, love. She is amazing in Physical. Physical almost has like that uh, Showtime uh, Nurse Betty weeds kind yeah, of a, kind yeah. of a vibe to it. <clears throat> you know what I love about Rose Byrne. <laughs> She's like one of those dream girl pixie girls, but now she's an adult. Mm -hmm. Like she could totally have been playing those like sprightly pixie, so quirky that you have to love her girls. Right. And now she's an adult. Right. You know, and some of that has been rubbed off by life. And and I think what Roseburn really lands on is, yes, I'm beautiful. And yes, I'm smart. And yes, I'm funny. But I'm a fucking mess. Right. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a total fuck up. I'm a total fuck up. I don't know what I'm doing. And uh, I want you to go through this uh, experience of life and the hell, you know, of me trying to become a success. And her trying to become a success in physical it's almost like a Breaking Bad kind of a thing. It's like she really sells out her own personal principles. Yeah. yeah. And, her, and her relationship with her political uh, liberal husband is really, really interesting. Because he's he, he is smart but dumb. Yes. And she is smart but dumb too. <laughs> yes. And she binge eats. She has an eating disorder. She binge eats like cheap hamburgers in a cheap hotel room naked naked yeah i mean like come on girls like that that we all want to do that like we want to do that we just want to eat massive amounts of greasy food naked like yes she takes a shower and goes home and acts like nothing happened but nobody ever sees her eat uh <clears throat> you know i i also in uh, appreciate that representation Absolutely. So, Platonic and uh, Physical, if you haven't seen it, de- definitely check those out. I think out. they're both probably on Apple TV. Yeah, too. I think they are too. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the one of the things I ended up that was kind of one of the conversations you had yesterday. One of the ones that I had was uh, an actor that we've worked with, um, and she was actually on crew also. She had some stuff to add to her acting reel, 
So she was sending me that and I was popping that in and we had a kind of a long conversation and we talked about her credit. Like, you know, I'm listing this project on IMDb and I asked her like, you know, on set, I think we called her production coordinator. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, I mean, I think what happened was she started out... She started out as a PA. Yeah, basically as a PA. And, and then, then... As we learned that more she... More and more things came up that she was taking care of. And it's like, okay, now you're a production coordinator. Right. We we up, kept upgrading her um, position. Right. So um, now I'm going to list the project on IMDb. And I just asked her, I was like... You know, I don't, I don't know what your current, like, set, you know, crew positions are on IMDb, but is there one that would actually help your resume? And and she was like, well, you know, what do you mean? I'm like, well, this is, this is my theory, and maybe it's wrong, but I feel like in indie film, uh, so many positions, so many titles, banner heading titles, you know, you might have... Often they're just smash ups of lots of other jobs. Like right. on that project, I was director of photography, but I was working in the production office. Oh yeah. I, w- I was kind of like a line producer. Right. I was DIT for sure. Right. You know, I was in charge of dumping all the cards and dailies and promo photos and like all that kind of stuff. Sinking. Right. And I was I was AD, but <laughs> I was also a, a, a producer and I was assistant to the director. And, you know, yeah, I mean, there's, it's just a lot, you know, in indie, because there's not a lot of the film roles taken, we end up doing multiple roles. But in my opinion, that's not good for your resume. Yeah. Like, first of all, you don't want to see one film that you were a PA, an actor, a production coordinator and boom operator on like that just screams cheap, cheap. Yeah. And then like. Well, of course, because they needed the work, you did it. But are you good at it? Yeah, it just doesn't give anybody, you know, you have to think about the whole concept of uh, paper information versus real-time information. Thanks to our sponsor, Movie Mode Merch, the graphic t-shirt store to outfit you for your next film set. Be the person wearing the t-shirt everyone asks, hey, where'd you get that shirt? Cast and crew alike love these inside jokes and filmmaking inspired designs. Check them out on Insta at Movie Mode Merch. There was a really good John Oliver uh, on Last Week Tonight, and it talked about how AI is reading your resumes and that the most important thing about your resume is that it has to be AI friendly. It has mm-hmm. to have basically the keywords and the things that AI is going to pass along and put you in the top stack of uh, candidates. And it's the same way, you know, in the film business. Uh, you know, people want specificity. Don't <laughs> diversify your credits, right? Decide what job it is you enjoy the most. Mm -hmm. The one that you seem most successful at doing. And if you do have multiple talents and multiple gifts, you should have multiple resumes. You should have multiple... Have one as a line producer. Yes. Have one as a first AD. Have one as a director. Whatever. Nobody wants gumbo. They want you to separate your seafood. (laughs) Yeah, they don't want gumbo. They want seafood. Rice. Vegetables. Yes, <laughs> exactly. They, they really do. Because honestly, so many people, you know what I mean? If you saw that you were a director and you're also trying to be a first AD. Right. They're going to wonder, is this person going to have a power struggle? Uh, yeah. And that has been a question uh, that I, I've had. You know, people are like, why would you AD, you know, when you, you've been a director? Isn't that really stepping down? No, it's not stepping down. It's stepping across or it's stepping into a new position because I don't believe that there's a caste system, you know, in film. I don't believe that there are people that are more important because if you remove those people, everything falls apart at just the same level. Well, <laughs> you, I'm sure you've been on a set where all the PAs quit. I mean, like, this is a thing that can happen. Oh, absolutely. Whatever people, like, and they're jerks. They start treating PAs bad. PAs get paid poorly. PAs don't come back. And it's hell. Try to be on a set where uh, you have a bad AD who is who is uh, unorganized or is um, even worse, just given a bad vibe. 
just, you know, oh. throwing energy, you know, and making everybody miserable on a set. When mutiny starts. Being oh, absolutely. Whispered. Absolutely. Movies are made with love, <laughs> man. Sometimes somebody who is in quote, quote, like, you know, in charge of like making the trains run on time, they think that, you know, they got to whip, you know, people, you know, it's, it's like people are rowing and they're the ones, you know, that are like beating them to go, go faster. Well, you, oh my God. You, you had a call from a director who wanted you to come be AD again for the reshoots. Mm -hmm. And he was like, you know, whenever we've done reshoots and we haven't had a first AD, you know, we haven't had you. It's been chaos. People are on their phones. Nobody understands what's going on. There's no sense of urgency. You know, there's nobody, you know, I need somebody to be the dick on set. And he's like, but but you're not even a dick on set. No. You're just like getting them to, to, to do what needs to be done and stay orderly and have fun. You are shepherding the sheep. That's what you are doing. Or, or you're like the sheep dog. You know, occasionally you're barking, but mostly you're running. Well, you know, the 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 good point that you bring up in herding, when, you know, I mean, you use ton, hella analogies. Yes. But the, the interesting thing about herding animals is that the whole goal of herding is to keep them calm. Yes. Because if you don't keep them calm, you know, like if there's a snake and one of the horses rears up and then... What happens? Everybody freaking scatters. Exactly. And then you got to round them all back up into right. the herd. Right. So the whole point of being a shepherd is to keep the herd calm. Exactly. You keep them calm. You keep them together. You, when they're together, they're strong and they're happy. And the more people are <clears throat> together on a film set, the stronger and the happier they are. And dissension. Oh, my God. The voice of dissension is what you have to have your ears to the ground constantly. Mm -hmm. Because there will always be a person. <laughs> you can't help it. They, maybe they think they're, they're, they're lowering themselves to even work on this production. Whatever. I don't care what size production you're on. You're going to have this person. And, you know, they're going to sow dissension. Right. They're going to be the little gossip. You know, who wants to say, oh, well, we ran over time yesterday. And, oh, you know, it's lunch break and blah, blah, blah. And Sorry, there was an alien spaceship landing there. <clears throat> Evidently. You know, you can have a, a voice of dissension that, that crops up in any circumstance, no matter how great you're trying to make the set experience. And you have to go straight to that person. Right straight to him look him straight in the eyes and ask him are you having problems on set mm -hmm. what are your you know can you please because i'm the first ad or i'm the line producer i'm this or i'm the producer i'm the director can you please tell me what are the problems that you're having and i will do my best to address them yeah you have no nothing attached to that right but you confront them head on honestly right you're not saying, well, I've heard you said this or that. Nothing. No. Just, hi, could you please tell me the, the the problems you're having on set? And I'll do my best to address them. Right. You're just being direct and you're nipping it in the bud. I mean, well, and, and, one, you're being, and you're being honest. They're going to get intimidated. Sure. And they're going to start making excuses. Sure. Okay. And eventually you might actually hear... Well, you know, we've been we've been late for uh, lunch, you know, five times in a row. You might actually hear that. My uh, my dad used to say uh, uh, quite brilliantly, if you have uh, twenty people in a room and everybody is talking about what a great experience they just had, and everybody is praising it, and everybody is happy, and there's joy in the room, and then there's one person in that room. Who goes, yeah, but, you know, really wasn't that great. I mean, honestly, you know, and God, it was so long. And, you know, that one person will silence 20 people. Yeah. Because nobody wants to be like, shut the fuck up. It was great. People don't want to do that. Right. You know, <laughs> that, you know, people, you know, in general want to avoid that kind of a conflict. So one 
a complainer will silence a room of praisers. Well, very often in your family, um, we would say, leave a tender moment alone. Mm. Yeah. You yeah. Know, I it, had, yeah. That was you, a. If you have nothing good to add, you know, just like if you have nothing, you know, good to say, shut your mouth. Right. Right. And, and read the room. You know, if, 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 you know, people are crying, cry with them. If people are laughing, laugh with them. <clears throat> you know, that is. You know, that's how you uh, don't ostracize yourself from your fellow man. But listen, there are people out there, and I've met them, who you could, you know, cover them in gold and fill their mouth with ice cream, and they would complain. Yeah, that's they just will who be they, are. they will be unhappy people. And all I can say about those people is. Don't put yourself in a position where you're counting on those people. Yeah, they they typically they typically are insecure, mm-hmm. and they're typically not the best at their job. No, I mean honestly, when we're casting or or crewing, we often will say, you know, hey, maybe we got to train this person a little bit more than the next person, but their attitude is superior. Oh, absolutely. I will always pick attitude over talent. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if you should always do that, but you know, always. That, that's kind of that's kind of why always always that, <laughs> that's kind of why like the worst thing you can do in like Hollywood is to get a reputation for being difficult to work with mm-hmm. because it's true it's true I mean we're spending inordinate amounts of time together instead of I'm spending time with you instead of my family right instead of my kids or whatever you know so I I need it to be positive I need it to be uh, a, a good experience, right? And and honestly, how do you make somebody uh, have a good experience? W- what is the way that uh, a very simple way to gauge on how to deal with people? I guess this is a pretty big topic right here, but uh, I'll give you a very simplistic uh, version of the way I feel like everybody wants to feel important. Okay, mm-hmm. everybody wants to feel. Like what they say and what they do matters. And if they're complaining, there is something that they have felt. It may not be real and it may not be true. But the thing is, if they feel it, it is true. It's true to them. Well, and I think that's where acknowledgement goes a long way. Yes. You have to acknowledge what they're feeling. You don't have to agree with it. You don't have to do anything else. But just acknowledge the problem. And if every, and if you go around in your life, you know, on a set, in any situation, and you walk up to somebody and you take personal time and you do not come off with energy or attitude and you give them a moment and make them feel like they are important and you make them feel like they matter. 99% of the time, you're going to get a good response back to that. Yeah, yeah. And the 1% of the time you don't, which are now that somebody has the spotlight, they are like, okay, great. I've got this shit bazooka. I'm going to shoot all over you now. Well, they, <laughs> they some people will take any questioning as confrontation. Oh yeah, absolutely. You can't help that. They're just they're they are. They're they're cocked and loaded for bear, you know. Right. And you can't help that. You just stepped right into that. And honestly, it would be better at that point to uh, you know, to cut them off. Cut them out. Yeah, yeah cut or them out. Just take the bullets. You stand there. You're the sacrificial lamb. You take the bullets. You mean so from the shit bazooka? You you take them. Okay. You take them because that's your role. It's your role to take them. Mm-hmm. And you <laughs> you take those hits and save other people. Right. In yes. the process. Get on the cross, baby. Get on the well, cross. <laughs> some, sometimes, depending on your position, that's what you got to do. Right. Well, like, now, well, honestly, there are people in this world that that's what they want. They want to see you up on a cross. They want to see you nailed. They want to have that feeling of, all right, I won. Okay? And you know what? Who cares? Who cares? If As long as you know that you are uh, not lessened in any way but the, by the feeling that they have won, let them feel like they won. 
Look, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell one quick little story. Okay. okay, and then we'll cut it off. We were making a TV show for a public access uh, station that actually a lot of people watched in Schenectady, New York. Okay, okay. it turned it turned from uh, that into an actual channel. We were making a show for that, and we were actually shooting in the closing down location that the public station had been inhabiting. Oh, man. <laughs> now, we were given permission to be in there. We were given permission in certain rooms that we could shoot. And they were moving out. There was, like, hardly anything. By the manager and owner yeah, of the, the space. The owner, yeah. I mean, we had complete permission and control. Autonomy. Autonomy. Yes. To be in there. I think they even gave us a key. Yes. Because they're literally moving out. The next day. Yeah. There's like sparse furniture. Yes. There's like hardly anything in the space. So, um, you know, we're kind of like, well, crap. Like, what's our set design? Because this looks terrible, right? Um, <clears throat> and what's the first thing we do whenever we go to a space? Look around. Yes. Look around. I mean, because of the situation and because of the control we had, we had the ability to go into other realms and pull in set design, pull in props. So we open this door and it's into this kind of like big open warehouse space. And there's tons of awesome shit in here. Right. Right. So we decked out this whole room. It looked great. We right. decked it out with like, there were Mardi Gras bees. And like, it was supposed to be the inside of a radio, st- college radio station. Right. And we made it look that way. There was posters and all kinds of stuff. It was stuff. like equipment. There was like, you know, things I mean, that we looked didn't like hurt radio. Anything. No, 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 like, no. We didn't hurt anything. We're just basically taking the things from this back area, we're bringing them into this room, and we're using it to decorate the set. It looked amazing. Yeah. Okay, so we had to shoot there for two days. Yes. Okay, so we shoot for the whole first day. Right. Lock it up. And put the thing on, hot set, don't hot touch. Hot set, don't yeah. touch. Right. Nobody was even going to be there. Right. We leave. We come back the next morning. Right. Everything's gone. It's like the uh, where the Grinch stole Christmas from the Who's. The Grinch stole <laughs> our set design. They're literally like the wires hanging from yeah <laughs> nothing. Nothing. Nothing is there. Nothing is there. We have we have only shot half the scene. Right. We still have to shoot the other half of the scene. Exactly. Okay, so <laughs> we're like, oh, we're we're fucked. We're yes. totally fucked. And we call, but we think, holy shit, did we lock the door? Have they been robbed? So we call the, you know, the people we have permission from. All the people that we have permission from. Everybody rushes down because they're they're thinking, oh, we've been robbed. But who gets there first? Who gets there first is the guy who took everything. And he is pissed. He is so mad. And come to find out, those were his personal things he was storing. At this business. Yes, including a couple of guns. Well, there were there were like vintage guns and all kinds of guns and new guns. And there were a lot of guns in there that we avoided. Um, so when the other people, the, you know, people in power show up. And he is screaming at me. I mean, oh, just I mean, furious. like I've never uh, you seen didn't anybody have to t- touch my quite son. so angry. He's so mad. Oh my god! Yes. And evidently, when when other people get there, they kind of take you aside and they say, "Look, you know, he's a guy. He has a lot of problems. Like he's like this. He gets very, very angry. He's super volatile." And you're like, "Yeah, and he's got a lot of guns back there." But what had happened, you know, was like that was where he was storing his stuff and he had a certain amount of time to get it out. And he got pissed that we had moved it and he was just taking all his shit to move it out because they were closing right. and down. Right, and he was, you know, and from his perspective, we had basically gone into his space, grabbed all of his shit and used it without his permission. And we did. Without knowing it. Without knowing that right. we did it. Right. But we didn't do it on purpose, but we did. I, and I remember when he was yelling at me, and I said to him, you know, and I, I was trying to be as calm as possible. You were kind possible. of like, I'm afraid this guy's going to have a heart attack. Yeah, He's I was, like so mad. Yeah, he was, he was so s- screaming and angry at me. And I said, you know, is it, it seems like you're really very, very, you know. Unhappy. Uh, unhappy. And is there anything like, that what's we. what's going on? Is there anything we can do about that? You know, is it's what I said. He's it's like, like, yeah, it's like, I can be a lot happier if you leave my shit alone. Yeah. Well, no, he says, he says, I'm unhappy because I hate life. 
Oh, I remember this. He says, I hate it. I mean, it was such no, dialogue that it, he, was. That it was just it like, was. wow. Like, what's what's wrong? You know, why are you so unhappy? And I believe my response I was, life. I believe my response is, well, what well, can we do about that? Can I get you laid? I believe is what I said. Can I get you laid? <laughs> <laughs> you were just like, man, because we need to do something about this. this. Is this is bad for you? Yeah, you know. I mean, you actually got concerned on a on a personal level for this stranger. So, so what we end up figuring out with the guy, he calms down with the help of the other people in the room. We get him to agree. No, no, no. He doesn't let us use any of his stuff still. Oh, right. No. Okay. No, no, no. But... We we had we had to come up with a creative way to so... keep shooting. I, I I think immediately we were just like, look, we saw into the room from this direction exactly all day yesterday. Right. So now we have to see into the room from the opposite direction. Right. And we never get to shoot that way again. Right. We're we just going to sh- we're going to shoot direction. We're shooting. We're going to decorate this sort of door frame and right. and, and this, going this to wall outside. And yes. this area yes. is the part of the room that we never saw in the other shots. Right. So we were fine. It worked. It it was great. It was great. We, yeah. It was not a problem at all. Right. And we had a lot of interest in, and exits going through that same door. So we were going to be shooting that way anyway, honestly. Right. Okay. <clears throat> Years later. Years later. We're at like a, a networking event, right? And this guy comes up, introduces himself. We're talking. He's, a, he's He a, looks completely different. Because when when he's we, like wearing a hip hat. Well, no, when, when we saw him before, he had like a long beard and yeah. long hair. Yeah, he was like like a like 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 a, like, like a man from the man from the mountains. Yeah, yeah, no, a unabomber. Yeah. Uh, and so when we left, I was like, you know who you were talking to? He was like, yeah, he he seems like a really great guy. I'm like, that's the guy that screamed at us. Yes. You know, shooting the the TV show at the at the public access channel, and you were just like, "No." Yes, and I became friends with that guy. We were friends. You know what? One time we had a minivan. It was an older minivan. Yes. Uh, we could not figure out. No, no mechanic could figure out what was wrong with that thing. This guy drove. Yes. Thirty minutes, forty five minutes in a snowstorm to come look at our van because he was super mechanical. And told us what what the problem was and how we needed to fix it, get it fixed. Yes. What to tell the mechanic. Yes. And that was exactly the problem. He was a great friend. He was a great he friend. Was a he was a great ally. A great, a... Uh, a fan. A, a, mo- a, a motivator for the entire film industry in upstate New York. Uh, just, a, just a really, really great guy. And I think we just caught, you know, we he just actually, got on his bad side at, you know... He passed away. He, he did. passed away of a heart attack. He did. You know, and, and, I went, and I went to his funeral, and I yeah. had nothing but great things to say about it. Yeah, but you know, he had a really, he was in a really bad place. Yeah, at that moment, you know, but but also, you know, don't give up on people, don't write them off. Right. Don't write them off yet. Yeah. Here is another thing that is kind of a a cringism in your family is start a new file. Yes. Start a new file on them. You got a file that exists on people you know and you keep sticking papers in there like mm. when they tell you who they are, right? Right. But people change. And think right. And and the thing about starting a new file is when you uh, don't add in the things from the old file into the new no. file. Put the old file in the shredder. Yeah. We're done with that. And start a new file. That's right. This is not my father when I was eight years old. This is my father now. Right. Okay. Start a new file. Start a new file. What is what is your relationship with him now? Right. What is re- your relationship with your ex-wife now? Okay. All of those things in the past, they're in the shredder. They're in the shredder. They're in the shredder they're now. They're gone. Absolutely. No, that, that's a really beautiful cringism. Yeah, it is. And it is incredibly, incredibly useful because we just have this tendency to just uh, accumulate, you know, the bad. We have such a hard time just uh, existing within the now. I want to hear those shredders running all over the world for the two people that are listening to this podcast. (laughs) Thanks, guys. (laughs) Thanks, guys. Thanks. And... uh, 
This has been great. I had no idea what we were going to talk about today. You know, and that's 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 the vibe I want to have every day. Every day, man. The, but but the thing I love about this podcast is it's just exactly what we always do. Right. We just sit here. We have breakfast. Yes. We talk. We're married. Yes. We make movies. There you go. That's the whole vibe. Living in oblivion. That's I, us. Did you say your name at the top? You're John. I'm John. This is Tracy. Hey, guys. The name of this podcast is Married to Movies. It's hard not to get romantic about movies. Thanks for listening to Married to Movies. John and Tracy will meet you for breakfast tomorrow. Thanks to our sponsor, Movie Mode Merch. Comfortable graphic tees made by and for awesome filmmakers to wear on set and off. Check them out on Insta at Movie Mode Merch. Mm-hmm.